Well, hello everyone. Welcome to this event. What's the value in of creative practice uh, organized by the Social Design Institute at uh, UAL? We are delighted to bring together a panel of speakers from different fields of practice and research uh, to explore the issue of value in relation to creative practice. And I'm delighted to be hosting uh, today's event and chairing the event. Uh, my name is Patricia Kaszynska. I'm Senior Research Fellow at the Social Design Institute. Um, I have been personally reflecting uh, on the question in the title of today's event for about uh, 15 years or so. And I've come to realize that, first of all, there aren't any easily uh, available answers, sadly. But secondly, that the question is unlikely to be settled with more and better evidence. Sometimes people talk about proving cultural value, but that presupposes that you can really find this killer piece of evidence and then everyone will agree. Um, I don't think that's so because uh, the question is difficult rather because of how the debate uh, has been framed and how the discussions are configured. So on the one hand, this is the question where different agendas intersect and converge and sometimes conflict. So you have uh, policymakers and the public, uh, academics, uh, as well as practitioners, are all these making claims and having stakes uh, to knowing the answer. So there's this uh, entanglement uh, and yet uh, not so much uh, agreement. Uh, this is something I'm looking at right now in a uh, uh, project for the Department for uh, uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, who want to know uh, the value in culture and heritage capital. This is all about uh, bringing uh, policymaking into the room at the same time as uh, uh, having a rigorous uh, academic re research set underneath this. But this is, this is not easy. So that this is one of the areas uh, where the question is configured in a way that makes it difficult to answer. But secondly, this is the question where different languages uh, converge from different disciplines. Um, we know that uh, the question of value in cultural practice uh, has been tackled from different angles in the arts and humanities, more recently in design, uh, as well as a long standing interest in sociology, management, cultural economics, and so forth. And yet it's very difficult to speak about the shared body of knowledge and understanding. And this is the starting point for today's event. What is clear is that uh, the question of today's event sits at the point where various discourses, tradition and disciplines intersect without necessarily talking to each other that well. So the aim of today is to induce this uh, conversation uh, the speakers uh, at the event are drawn uh, from different fields of uh, creative practice and research from different uh, academic uh, disciplines, and they will all uh, reflect on the question from within where they sit in this ecology. In order to uh, answer the general question about the value in and of creative practice, uh, they will look at uh, a way of breaking it down into something that maybe is uh, little more manageable. So if you looked at the uh, introduction to the event, the blurb, um, we uh, want to talk about the what. What is the object of valuation in creative practice? And where does the value reside? Is it the cultural and creative assets, the audience, the organizations, the relationship between some or all of these or something entirely different? There's the why. What are the purposes and motivations behind asking this question? Why is the question asked in the first place and who needs to know? And there is the how. What methods and registers are acceptable from the perspective of practitioners, audiences, stakeholders, and decision makers to articulate and capture the value in and of creative practice? I know that speakers today uh, will um, cover these and address these uh, with different uh, emphasis. Uh, some will speak about the what, some about the why, some will take a more holistic approach, but I'm confident 
that uh, we have in the room, uh, the kind of people who are up uh, to the task and uh, to the challenge. So without further ado, at this point, I would like uh, our speakers just to introduce themselves uh, um, in the order that they'll be speaking. So uh, Paolo, uh, Lucy, Joyce, and Indy, that assuming that uh, we have Indy in the room. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Paolo Ferdi, and I'm an associate professor uh, in accounting at the University of Bologna in Italy, where I'm also directing uh, the master program in innovation and organization of culture and the arts. Um, I'm working on two research projects relating to values and valuation in the cultural and creative fields. Uh, the first, which I will also present today, concerns the valuation of heritage assets for financial reporting purposes. Uh, the second one is a Horizon 2020 founded project on uh, understanding and capturing the societal value of culture. Uh, the, the project nickname is Uncharted, if you want to check it out. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Lucy Orta, Professor of Art and the Environment at the University of the Arts London, a pra uh, artist practitioner, and also founder of the Art for the Environment Residency Program at the University. And I'll be talking about aspects of my practice and value relating to that practice. Hi, good morning, my name is Joyce Yi. I'm a professor of design and social innovation at Northumbria University based at Newcastle. Um, my work is really around um, understanding and supporting innovative practices in individuals and communities um, and how, how design supports uh, creative capacities. Specifically, I guess the work that I'll be sharing today is based on two body of work. One was is around working with um, practitioners supporting social innovation in Asia Pacific, looking at and looking to understand how they evaluate the practices and what is the value to them as practitioners. Um, but also I've been involved in a project with the British Council in Thailand, looking at um, the value and impact of creative hubs and creative districts there for um, in four areas. So thank you. Hey, good morning. Um, my name is Indy Johar from Dark Matter Labs. Uh, delighted to be here. I suppose we work a lot at the systems level of transformation and what that means. And I suppose the question I really want to ask is, what does it mean to be a creative society? Um, and uh, and what would that mean in terms of looking at a societal scale um, effects of this stuff? So moving out of kind of individual practice and hubs and environments to at a societal scale, which I think is a big transformation that's required. Thank you. Great. Uh Thank you so much. And I think you all have a, a taste and a preview of what's to come. Uh, each speaker will speak for 10 minutes. So a 40 minutes in total. After this, I will let them ask questions of each other um, before abusing uh, my chair position and asking yet another difficult question. Uh, and then I will open to the floor uh, for your difficult questions. And here, uh, please use the uh, Q&A if you want to ask a question. Um, Luis, our institute manager, and I will be looking at the uh, Q&A box. Uh, I, you, you are currently unmuted, uh, so this way we might be able to do it more uh, efficiently. So, but before, before all of this, uh, let me start with a uh, little warm up. So each speaker has a minute to respond. And here I have to say, I'm so glad I'm chairing uh, the meeting today rather than actually speaking and participating because the questions are really very difficult. Uh, so uh, I'm so pleased to be asking them rather than answering. And yet the warm up question with a one minute response from each speaker is, can you justify the exceptionalism often made for creative practice as being uniquely challenging and difficult in terms of articulating and capturing its own value. So basically, is it, is it really true that it's harder, more difficult to articulate and capture the value of creative practice when compared, for instance, to the value of walking a dog or having a child? Okay. 
over over to you, Paolo. Uh, thank you, thank you, Patricia. Well, uh, I would start with a premise uh, that I think that the very fact that we want to make the value of culture and creative practices uh, evident means that their own value is not taken for granted uh, anymore. So it's like with Santa Claus, right? Uh, when a kid starts looking for evidences, for evidence, she's not already believing in it <laughs> anymore. Uh, then why it is harder than in other fields? I've been thinking about it. Uh, um, well, I think it's mainly because creative practices uh, cut across multiple fields or arenas. So the personal, the organizational, societal arena. Um, so it is not just an individual, an individual matter, right? Uh, um, so creative practices raise different expectations uh, to different people depending, uh, depending on the context. A second aspect that makes uh, um, value attribution and value capturing harder, uh, I think depends on the democratization of judgment. Uh, think about online reviews, for instance, uh, uh, and also the democratization of production. And yeah, we can refer to user generated contents, uh, uh, coupled with uh, a general weakening of the role of experts, both in uh, uh, you know, legitimizing critiques and, uh, and production. Uh, this, I think, has led to an explosion of point of views and perspectives uh, uh, that need to be taken into account when articulating. Uh, and I would prefer the values uh, with uh, the plural rather than, than the value, because there are clearly more than, more than one involved. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, shedding light on, on some of the uh, complexities. Uh, over to you, Lucy. I had um, a problem in deciding actually which uh, value I wanted to capture, and it's probably um, the question for a lot of practitioners. Um, as you just alluded to, Paolo, is it personal satisfaction or well-being of creating the work, or is it for an audience? And then what scale of audience? Is it one person? Is it small groups? Is it a large community? <laughs> so, um, I mean, in theory, um, uh, the notion, uh, you know, if from the outset the notion of value is factored into the practice, then it should be possible to capture it and, and then evaluate um, that value. But quite often, um, as a practitioner, we're a one man band. So, you know, it's difficult to do that on top of everything else. So, who can we bring in to help us capture the value on those different scales? And then depending on the scales, this can be costly. So who's paying for it? And then why are we paying for it? You know, what's the benefit of understanding the value of the practice that we're doing? Um, so hopefully in the presentation I'll give, I'll eludicate on some of these areas and give you some examples um, a little bit later on. Perfect, thank you, thank you. Joyce. Great, uh, what Paolo and Lucy said, <laughs> no, I think I think uh, to answer, I suppose to you, specifically your question. I don't think we should be in a should having should be having to keep justifying the value creative um, uh, practice. But I also don't think we need to also be defensive in that it's exceptionally different than perhaps you know, the benefit of walking in the trees, walking in the woods for well-being. And, and I think it's ultimately down to the values that, what we, we value as a society. And that's the challenging part, isn't it? How do we shift that in terms of, um, because everything that we have now is colored by a very specific economic lens in how we value these other activities that is not directly, um, allowing us to, you know, to see the, the direct economic benefits. So I think where I would be coming from is really about why do we need, why do we value it? How, you know, what is the purpose of valuing and for whom? And I think for whom is really important. And as Lucy alluded to, you know, what is the value to the creative practitioner? What is the value of someone who's involved in that co-creation? What's the value of the audience? And what's the value of the curator, for example? So I think for me, um, it's about who benefits. That's actually the, the more important question for me. So thank you. Perfect. What a, what a, what a start. We have, uh, we're so much closer to solving the question already, it feels indie. 
Um, yeah, no, thank you for the question. Great question. Um, so I would start by saying, I think creative practice exists everywhere and needs to exist everywhere. So the person walking the drug can exist in an act of creative practice. And I think the idea that there is, it is separated from society in itself is part of the problem. So first thing, let's talk about the democratization of creative practice. The second thing is that whilst creative practice exists in everything, there are higher orders of creative practice. So what is the value of a song that moves you? Right, One that changes your emotional state, that you make different decisions, different quality of decisions. We don't know how to value that, right? Um, what is the what is the value of language shifts that change our perceptions of the world that allow us to see whole avenues of possibilities? Right? These values exist not at the level of our current economic system; they exist at the level of population level effects. And so, the the value of music can be, I think, understood in a much larger sense at a population level than you can at the individual level. And I think we often try to value things at the transaction level rather than the population level. And then I think even more, I mean, like I say, language, uh, words, or how we see each other, music, all these intangibles are actually fundamental to building new ways of seeing. So they disrupt historic legacy pathways. So when they change our possibility of seeing the pathway of the future in a different way, they have incredible value. How do you value that? <laughs> How do you how do you value uh, a song, an emotional song, which changes someone's life trajectory and thereby changes the trajectory of their future? There's an infinite value of options that that it generates in that sense. So I think I think the question of value is not something we should be afraid of. It's a question of value we, we need to embrace. The problem is we don't need to sit value valuing culture into existing accountancy frameworks. That I think is the problematic domain. And too often, we because we've we've been in, insufficiently educated as a profession, we end up defaulting into existing accountancy frames, which actually only work in the world of tangible value. And the final thing is valuing divergence, right? So even di being culturally divergent, i.e., divergent to what is perceived as valuable now, in itself is value, because it opens up the option possibilities of society. So I think we we. Our education of value is really poor. Our construction of value is really limited. And that's the problem. And I think we should embrace the theory of value, but in a much more expansive way at a societal level. Thank you. Well, thank you. What a, what a start. <laughs> so now, for more, I will pass over to Paolo for his presentation. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Oh. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, as a contribution to today's discussion, I would like to share with you some, uh, um, some insights uh, of a kind of controversial attempt to capture, to capture value. Actually, uh, referring to what Indy was saying before, I bring in the, the accountancy framework, uh, being a, a researcher in the, in the accounting uh, in the accounting discipline. Uh, so the, the, this controversial attempt, the controversial attempt I'm talking about uh, is the valuation of uh, public um, collection, public heritage collection for financial reporting, uh, reporting purposes. So basically putting a price tag on works of art uh, and then include the overall value under assets in the state of financial position. Now, this practice uh, is highly supported by accounting standard setters. Uh, well, you may may not be familiar with uh, how accounting regulation is established, but uh, you know, just for you to let you know, there is this, uh, at least for public entities, uh, uh, the, the, one of the main standard setter is the uh, IPSSB, International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board. And they're really advocating for um, heritage asset valuation. Um, specifically, here I'm referring to uh, two recent documents, uh, the 2017 consultation paper on financial reporting for heritage in the public sector uh, that was then included in the exposure draft uh, on property, plant, and equipment. Uh, why are these documents important? Uh, well, because then, you know, national governments will draw on these documents to uh, decide what kind of uh, accounting has to be mandated to uh, public organizations. 
now the, the reason I'm talking about uh, about this practice uh, uh, here is that it represents in in my view uh, a kind of worse practice in valuation so the, the main argument I will try to make is that this practice shows a sort of over emphasis on how to measure uh, without explaining why we should do so and eventually displaying uh, a lack of understanding for the what, so for the object of valuation that is public uh, heritage, heritage collection. Now, if you want, whatever I'm saying uh, draws on uh, these two uh, um, piece of research of, of mine uh, written with uh, um, my former colleagues at RMIT, at RMIT University in, uh, in Melbourne. So what I'm trying to do is to um, share with you a sort of um, textual analysis with the, the, of the consultation paper issued by Ipsos B in 2017. Uh, what we noticed is that uh, uh, this consultation paper puts a lot of emphasis on how to value, on how to do it from a technical point of view. So the starting point uh, uh, is the starting claim of Ipsos B is that uh, in many cases it will be possible to assign a monetary value to heritage assets. And then this consultation paper spends, uh, I mean, uses a lot of pages uh, to explain uh, which techniques uh, could be applied, like historical cost uh, when uh, uh, heritage items have been purchased recently, uh, market value when there is an active market available, uh, replacement cost, for instance, in the case of scientific specimens, uh, and replacement cost is, for instance, how much it would cost to go to, uh, to the jungle and find again uh, that, uh, uh, that fossil or, or whatever and bring it back to the museum. So a highly technical approach uh, and also kind of business as usual approach. Here I put this, quote from the report uh, where the board is saying that, you know, it's like just for any other revenue expenses assets, we just follow the rule uh, we have available in, uh, in accounting. Now, why is this problematic? Uh, well, because the report really spends, uh, allocates very little words to explain why we should do so. So they claim that we should do so for decision making. Uh, yet they really spend uh, a little time explaining which decisions could be made based on the information of the financial value of collections. Actually, what we found by looking uh, at Australian museums, so, which are, let's say, forced to, to value their collections since the 90s, is that they do so, but they don't use that information at all. So if we look at how they present their annual achievements. Uh, they don't really say, you know, our collection is uh, uh, has a value of $5 billion. They don't use the information, they don't, they don't uh, work with it. Plus, uh, rather than being used for decision making, this information uh, uh, is likely to have to, to lead to kind of unintended consequences. So for instance, here you have uh, this example from the Western Australia Museum. This graph charts the, the increase in value, in the value of the collection over the years. Uh, basically in 2014, the, the value of the collection dropped by almost 40%. Uh, and the reason was a sort of accounting mistake in valuation in 2008. Uh, what was the real consequence? Well, the real consequence was that the museum paid a higher insurance premium from 2008 to 2014 because of a, you know, a conflated value of, uh, of, of the collection. We have here another example, the Museum of Applied Art and Science in, in Sydney. Here in uh, 2015, uh, they decided to exclude to exclude the value of the steam engine uh, from, uh, uh, from the, the total value of the asset because they claimed uh, it was impossible to measure it reliably. The consequence, the unintended consequence uh, was that uh, because of this write down, uh, 
the museum that he had registered uh, a loss, so the uh, lost money. So it's a sort of, uh, you know, uh, accounting unexpected, unexpected consequence uh, of this accounting fiction that concerns putting a uh, financial value on non-financial, basically non-financial items. Uh, then the, 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 the consultation paper talks a lot about accountability, mentions accountability 13 times. The issue here is that uh, it is unclear to whom accountability is owned and for what. So for, what, is, what is the object of evaluation? Why would this refer to, to accountability? Uh, what is the meaning of accountability for, for, public, for public museums? So, this brings us to the, um, the last issue. So what is valued? So when looking at the, the consultation paper, we realized that this approach to valuation is really uh, poor in terms of understanding the object of valuation. Um, so the assets, the, the, the collection is valued as it was, uh, um, as if we were talking about goods that could be traded. But actually, when a work of art enter, enters a public collection, um, it is removed from the cut and thrust of the market. So museums do not have the power to trade commercially in heritage collection. Besides, uh, curators are not accountable for maximizing the financial values of heritage. Okay, they're not accountable for, they, they don't look at indicators like return on investment, return on equity, uh, and things like that, that would be, that are useful in, uh, for profit environment, but that makes little sense uh, in this kind of context. Uh, you know, this financial valuation sometimes, uh, I mean, kind of quite often uh, misrepresents the values of this collection. Uh, consider, for instance, this example of the Melbourne Field Center in the 90s when they were asked to value the collection. What they did was to uh, assess the total length the total length of film they owned. And then they multiplied this uh, length by the cost per meter of acquiring new film. So without any contents at all. So just length multiplied cost of new, uh, of new film. This clearly misrepresents uh, the, the value. It gives a, a, a picture of the, uh, it gives a, a representation of the collection that is that is not uh, that is not fair that does not reflect uh, uh, the, the plurality of values uh, that this collection could uh, um, uh, could express. So to reach uh, a conclusion, and I think I kind of stick into my ten minutes. Uh, why did I want to talk about this? Well, because it shows uh, a valuation practice where again a lot of focus is put on the how without really understanding the why and, uh, and the what, minimizing the, the, the effort done to understand why we should do it uh, and what we are valuing. A, a different approach, so we can learn something from these worst practices, uh, I guess. Uh, so a different approach would require uh, looking at the what, the why, and the how as uh, looking at the interplay between these, uh, these issues. Uh, how could that be achieved? Well, first of all, what we notice is that in the development of these standards, uh, there is very little participation by, uh, you know, museums curators. So they're not involved in, uh, in, a, in, under, in to understand whether this is sensible or not, and what kind of techniques could be, could be used. That's a first uh, suggestion. The second one, uh, would be for mainly for the accounting profession, but also for uh, everyone who is involved in measurement, that is to consider accounting as a, not just as a technical practice, uh, but also as a social practice, meaning thinking about the social consequences of measuring and as a moral practice. So as a, as a practice that uh, has to deal with a plurality of values, not just with uh, the, economic uh, or financial or financial value. So I think I'll, I'll stop here and I leave the 
floor, the digital floor to the next, uh, to the next presenter. That's, that's amazing. Thanks so much, Paul. You have not only set out uh, very clearly what the problems are, but also suggest, suggested some so solutions. Uh, thank you. If uh, any of you at this stage have questions to Paolo, please put them in the chat in the Q&A. We'll not address them just now, but, but if, if there's something on your mind, uh, please note it down before it disappears. But right now I'm passing over to Lucy. So yeah, I've um, quickly um, added some of these images to my presentation today because um, just recently finished this work called Nexus Architecture in conjunction with the Carnival of Crisis at UAL, which took place during the COP26. And uh, you can see here um, a series of interconnected suits that are being customized by students at uh, the university, actually the second year BA textile students from Chelsea, and uh, then performing these in the public space uh, during the Carnival of Crisis. Um, just I thought, I. I show these because time and time again, I've come across this um, in terms of how, how people um, collaborating, co-creating, working together with me, participating, whatever language might, might use for this, is time and time again, how they've expressed um, the fact that uh, they're able to um, portray or express climate messages through creative practice. I didn't realize this was possible so I think in terms of this project having a value or and the other projects that I'm going to show you today, how important it is to allow that, um, to allow that space for expression and creative practice to uh, challenge, to talk about, to voice opinions, uh, to express critical issues in society today. So that's just a, a quick starting point from a, a really fantastic and uh, emotional event that took place during the Carnival of Crisis. So um, for the purpose of today's discussion, um, I've reflected on the notion of value through an angle of um, practice, which builds on the notion of operational aesthetics. This has um, been proposed by the critic and curator Nicolo Borio back in 2005, actually. And um, I mean, I've interpreted it as the capacity for inclusive or participatory art processes and the elements of their production and also the sites of their dissemination to help empower and to amplify change. And this could be, and we've talked about this either on a very individual personal level, but also on a community level. So um, in order to put into practice operational aesthetics, um, we've been testing a number of methods through a series of long-term art projects. We could call these the art practice, if you like. And these art projects are closely intertwined with meta themes. So these are critical social issues. And these uh, meta themes that are affecting communities on a local or a global scale. So I've chosen three projects, but I could have chosen many more. The first one is 70 by 7 The Meal. The second is Antarctica World Passport. And the third is the Lost Species Project, the Lost Species Handbook. So very briefly, this is uh, 70 by 7 The Meal. It's a picture from the 39th Act. So um, that's 39th Acts that have taken place since the year 2000. And this one took place in 2015 in the city of Peterborough. Actually, um, 45 different acts of these meals have taken place since the inception, since the year 2000. So the series 70 by 7 takes the everyday ritual of dining and introduces motifs, symbols, language, collected through a research phase prior to the staging of these public meals. And the practice involves the production of the event, the installation in the public space, and then also the relational objects that um, uh, particularly uh, I create, uh, but others create too. But um, the ones that I create, such as the table runners and the dining plates that form part of the installation. And um, so this meal in Peterborough was the focus of a harvest weekend, which was curated by the local arts organization Metal Peterborough. And it took place in the Cathedral Square of Peterborough and became the site um, of 
uh, an open air gathering for 500 local residents. And you can see them there sitting around the tables, enjoying themselves, eating absolutely fantastic food, uh, talking, discussing, et cetera, et cetera. Just to set the context of um, this uh, meal taking place, Metal Peterborough was founded um, by Jude Kelly um, in 2002. And as a result of an Arts Council survey, identifying Peterborough as one of the cities which is most culturally deprived uh, in the UK. So um, this was absolutely, uh, was already a fabulous challenge to engage as most, many people as possible in uh, creating a cultural event that would bring communities together. So one of the ambitions of the meal was to reinstate a farmer's market in Peterborough, um, which originally was an important economic social gathering from the 12th century to the 1960s and then closed. And this farmer's market had traditionally been the site that bridged and generated links across the culturally diverse communities in Peterborough, many of them who are engaged in agricultural production. And the market itself was a way of raising awareness about organic locally sourced food, which can offer models of healthy eating, as well as showcasing ancient traditions that historically have broken down cultural barriers and bind people together. So the meal acted as a catalyst to bring all of these elements of a farmer's market and an event, a harvest event, including the objects and symbols of a harvest, as well as the associated feelings generated, including social inclusion and the sense of community. So um, in terms of the value, um, what have we got here? Well, the event won the um, Love British Food Harvest Heroes Award in acknowledgement of people who organize the most managed and inclusive celebrations of local food. So that's already really fantastic. Um, and then I guess um, how I'm trying to value or thinking about the value of the projects are set against some uh, aims and objectives possibly. So the meal investigated ways to establish and engage a social dynamic, gathering people and communities in public space. And also it's the empowering of those communities, uh, especially those with limited access or not normally engaged in the arts. As I mentioned, Peter are being uh, culturally deprived um, and the inclusive non-hierarchical relationships of collective art making. So all the events that took place, workshops, um, Etc. that took place around the building of this uh, meal project. Um, so there's a really uh, wonderful um, reflective piece of writing in the publication Food and the Public Sphere that was published by Black Dog to coincide with an exhibition that took place in Peterborough post event. And uh, this is by Chris Erskine, who's a resident and a waiter uh, during the meal. He volunteered to wait on the tables. And um, I just thought I'd read out um, what he wrote about it. So uh, on top of all of the um, dimensions of the participation it triggered, he says, um, and I'm uh, citing the quote here, I'm citing his, his text. He says, I met a man who had heard about the Harvest Weekend via local radio. So he traveled from Norwich by bus on the Saturday, over two hours each way. He was so struck by, by the atmosphere of the event that despite having to travel back the same evening, he returned the next day to witness the meal taking place on the Sunday. No one knew his story, but fortunately he joined the meal via a spontaneous invite. Towards the end, he approached me and shared the sense of joy and inclusion that he had experienced. He had spent most of his life, and these are his words, as an observer of life but told me that his experience over the weekend made him feel like somebody who was accepted and valued. So I think um, that sums up the value uh, for 70 by 7, the meal. So the second, uh, the second project is Antarctica World Passport. And many of you at the university will know this project. Um, this is an ongoing participatory component of the Antarctica project that um, we began in 2007, following an expedition to Antarctica to found a village, to found a community around the values of the Antarctic Treaty. So um, we have created a facsimile passport that you can see there in the images uh, being held by the passport officers. And uh, the passports are delivered via passport offices that exist in different sculptural formats. 
They're generally rudimentary structures constructed with reclaimed wood and found objects synonymous with makeshift border crossings. And inside the passports are texts relating to climate change and displacement and also a pledge. So to um, cut it really short, act in favor of sustainable development, defend natural environments, fight against climate change, support humanitarian activity and share values of peace and equality. So as well as museums and biennials, cultural festivals where the general public can collect passports, passport distribution offices have been installed at the COP21, at the Nansen, Nansen um, Initiative Global Consultation and the UN Migration Week in Marrakesh, where representatives from UN member states, NGOs can um, gather to draw up international migration strategies, for example. Um, so uh, you can see uh, down below some delegates that have uh, queued up to acquire their passport, and we printed 2000 versions of the passport for this occasion. And this process of traffic transfer of your identity to that of the Antarctica world citizen is an integral part of the project. So how can we value all of this? Not all of it, some of it. Um, well, of course, um, and, and then these aims and objectives, I guess it invites diverse audiences to reflect on questions of identity by, coming, by becoming members of a symbolic, symbolic world community. And the passport diffuses information, expands on the discussion concerning climate change and migration, um, particularly those induced by climate related disasters. And another element of um, what it does, the passport is it engages government representatives and of course others during conferences, addresses disaster displacement and a lobbying force to bear on government policy to address migration. So um, the passport can do a lot. And, um, you can see here we've got 37,000 uh, world citizens, over 37,000 world citizens online. So we can actually quantify the amount of people signing up for the passport and pledging um, to the, the, the um, uh, pledges that I mentioned earlier. And we actually have 72,000 copies of the passport printed, which is absolutely incredible. And I think um, in terms of um, the value this has to um, the convenings, the UN convenings, for example, um, from Professor Walter Kalin, who's an expert advisory, uh, he's part of the expert advisory group on the UN panel of internet, internal displacement. He says it contributes a visual symbol of the challenge of disaster displacement and um, goes on to say that um, the passport can be taken home and shared with colleagues and families. And one delegate, for instance, returned to the booth to ask if, if he could have more passports to share with his children and talk about the challenges of displacement. So I um, hope uh, that value is evident in the project there. And then the final project is um, the Lost Species Handbook and Mask Making Kit. And this forms part of a recent research project um, that I've called Masking Ecology, Crisis and Symbolism. And uh, very broadly, um, it aims to engage members of the public with climate change research and related societal issues through different practice iterations. That's the uh, overall research project. And the resources that we see here, the Lost Species Handbook and the Mask Kit, have been made in collaboration with Professor Sophie Page, a historian at UCL, medieval historian. And they um, can be used to elicit the imagination of voices of participants, uh, specifically those underrepresented in climate change conversations. And I illustrated the handbook. You can see some uh, little pictures there, some images of the illustrations uh, that describe 38 endangered, extinct every day and extraordinary animals from the medieval period. Um, of course, that provides information into species loss across the UK, and as well as the cultural meanings of animals that are disappearing from our collective imagination. And through the handbook, we wanted to specifically explore the metaphor of lost, of loss, sorry, so the lost species, but those past, present, and also the lost imaginary species from Sophie's historical examples. And these are uh, the lost relationships between the human and animal. 
and hopefully these will help to inspire and imagine new fictional futures relating to the climate emergency. And then for that purpose, I designed a mask making kit, extracting the main features of a set of animals described in the handbook and created patterns so that um, the general public can use these as a basis for mask making. You can see all of that in the images, the illustrations. And then finally, um, how I've interpreted the value. So using, um, again, against these aims and objectives, using the resources to encourage people to reflect on relationship with the natural world through history, ecology, and creative practice. And then also understanding the impact and increasing awareness of the climate crisis and species loss, and then particularly amongst young people. So I was able to test all of this um, with a group of students attending the UAL Insights program. So these are young people with limited access to higher education from the university's partner college and sixth forms. And um, I think uh, the value of the resources, the, how the students have used them can be seen through the different types of participation and the outcomes, the absolutely incredibly creative outcomes um, from the 76 uh, participants, the masks, and also the climate manifestos they wrote um, to accompany their masks. And then um, there's some pre and post evaluation through questions that are inserted into the project. So with um, 22 out of 23 students responding that they felt more empowered to speak out through this kind of creative activity. So perhaps at this point, it's interesting to reflect on the scale of value. Is it one single person or is it a group? Um, so I'll just end there and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. I hope I haven't gone over time. There's so much to talk about. Thank you so much, Lucy, for, for this uh, uh, extremely rich presentation. What I liked is how you illustrated that through your practice, you are already tapping into the solutions suggested by Paolo. There's the participatory uh, valuation present. Uh, there's also the uh, clear uh, relationship to meta values, the uh, societal, social values, moral values, and so forth. But yes, we are uh, not running out of time, but uh, um, have to move on. So uh, I'm I'll pass over to Joyce and please, if you have questions, the audience, uh, um, write them in the uh, Q&A box. Over to you, Joyce. Thanks, Lucy, and thanks, Paolo. Both really um, interesting presentations to kind of, uh, you know, follow on from. So I'll share my screen first, and hopefully you'll be able to see my first slide. So, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to use my 10 minutes to sort of share with you some insights that's been gained through the work that I've been doing um, through um, the Designing Social Innovation and Asia Pacific Network. Um, we work with practitioners who use creative methods to support social innovation initiatives in the region. Um, and they might be what you call sort of intermediaries working directly with the communities, mainly to help capacity building through training. So hopefully um, we'll go through that. Um, get it started. Yeah. So I know that, um, so Paolo and Lucy talked a bit about kind of the, the what, how and why, um, um, but I particularly am interested in the kind of why question. So, specifically from my perspective and my work with practitioners um, in Asia Pacific, is a question around why do we evaluate social impact uh, arising from creative activities? So to give you a bit of a background, so that our focus on this topic really have been driven and shaped by ongoing conversations that we've been having with practitioners in, in the region since 2015. Um, and, you know, the, the platform and the network really is a way for, for myself and my co-founder, Yoko Akama and RMIT, to bring together um, creative practitioners that are supporting social innovators in Asia Pacific and to understand what they do on the ground um, and to understand the challenges and issues that they, they have. And a lot of the conversations that we've been having really highlighted a number of things, but actually one of the key things that came out was really about the um, challenge in evaluating social impact arising from the work with communities. 
So to give you a bit of context, the practitioners that we work with through our network um, are mainly funded through international aid, um, philanthropic or government funding. What that means is this usually comes with strings attached, as some of you might know, and a lot of this work and program requires quite formal monitoring and evaluation to happen uh, in order to report back to the funders. And usually um, these type of impact evaluation uh, is really set up to identify obviously the impact arising from the program, but is a, a, a required component. And what you see here in the diagram is the number of, I guess, stakeholders involved in this, you know, um, types of work. So you have the funder, which is usually the commissioner. Um, you have the evaluation partner who's often separate and outside and sits outside of the program delivery. And you might have the practitioner, the implementer or intermediary that then delivers that program. And these are the practitioners that we work with and they directly work with the community or the stakeholder group. So as you can see, there are a number of stakeholders and with a number of um, requirements and agendas to a certain extent. So um, the question of value and to whom becomes even more important. Um, to give you a bit of the background, if you're not that familiar with traditional M&E uh, evaluation, is that they are often very summative and it's retrospective, so it often happens towards the end of the project. It is often very top-down and funded focused, so it is about um, evaluating based on what is valued from a funder's point of view, you know, accountability and uh, Paolo mentioned accountability as, as one of the key aspects. And it's often also predetermined. So the kind of outcomes and um, impact is something that has already been predetermined or pre-programmed in at the start. Now, if you worked on any kind of social innovation projects or you know, creative types of projects, you know that that is actually really ill-fitting, certainly because you know, a lot of these work that our practitioners work on is really emergent, um, is situated, and because it's community led, you really don't know what what the what is the impact or what what is value until you sort of get there and you start to work. And importantly for us, working in Asia Pacific, a lot of these um, frameworks and ontologies um, are really based on traditional what we call Western forms of knowledge and analysis. So prioritizing certain types of evidence, prioritizing certain types of accounts. Um, so for us, that's really problematic. And for our practitioners, that's also really challenging to, um, to kind of work with. So this brings us back to this question of why evaluate and who benefits? So there's a need for, you know, trying to be a bit more diverse in how we think about evaluation. So thinking about why we need an alternative or an additional approach, because often, as you can see in the previous slide, evaluation is very much divorced from what's happening on the ground, what's emerging on the ground. And it can be very burdensome to some practitioners. Now, sometimes they bring in an external evaluator, but sometimes they also ask the practitioners um, the program delivers to evaluate it and be part of the project. Now that can be burdensome because they might not have the time, they might not have the capacity. Um, and that means it becomes an additional thing that they have to do rather than focusing on the, the impact that they're trying to deliver with the community. And oftentimes, a lot of these questions around evaluation and, and for whom is not directly beneficial to the stakeholders and communities because it's been preset and it's been set by what the funder wants to understand and learn about, you know, their funding and how it's making an impact, but not directly for the community themselves. So there is a need for a model to reflect on what is happening on the ground. So what we're beginning to, to discuss and come towards to is this idea that we need to treat evaluation as a learning process, as a learning opportunity. And this is nothing new. Um, it is really based on um, uh, um, Michael Patton's work on developmental evaluation. And that really suits the kind of emergent nature of a lot of these community-led, bottom-led 
uh, approaches. What we have done on, on top of that, and when we've learned with our practitioners what they themselves do, is to kind of um, ex extract that into what we consider key principles of what we call learning center evaluation. Now, I, won't, I don't have time to go through all of them, but in this diagram, we've identified some key principles around what a learning center evaluation practices might look like and might feel like. So it's really about building trust and relationships. It's about participation and it's about grounded in place, culture and locality. That's really important. You know, the, the, the idea of what does it matter? Who does it matter? What knowledge do we consider as, as kind of evident um, and to be listened to? And then there are a number of ways around what we, we talk about, how you might share learnings, how you might test ideas, how you might adapt process and outcomes. Things that as creative practitioners, we, we take for granted, but actually is a very, very different mindset in, in other areas. So I, again, I won't have you know, amount of time to really go into too much depth of how the practitioners that we spoke of are using you know, evaluation to learn, but I can highlight some you know, basic, simple examples. So uh, these are four examples. The one on the top left is um, an example of from uh, Myanmar. Um, Point B, who's a it's a design and learning innovation lab. They were looking at trying to work on uh, a project with casework in in Myanmar government, trying to train um, social care, social welfare care for children, and how to. Uh, to start delivering that because prior to, I think, 2000 and, um, 2019, they never had a departmental uh, department of social welfare. So they kind of had to, to build that from scratch. And one of the ways they were trying to understand um, changes and behaviors was around using the method of most significant change stories. So using storytelling to understand how that has changed the lives of the caseworkers in doing the work and in the training. Uh, in the second um, example, uh, the bottom left is a uh, Water Warriors, which is a kind of local community-based group that looks at cleaning up the waterways around a, a, a campus in Malaysia. And one of the ways they were again, trying to use evaluation was using social media. Um, to crowdsource diverse viewpoints from the community to find out what the issues are and what they need to be tackling next and what they expect as an outcome. Um, on the top right, we have uh, another example from Malaysia, but this time in East Malaysia, and they were looking to understand the sustainability, environmental sustainability in coastal communities. And one of the ways they were trying to do this was actually hiring local community researchers, training them up. So not only was that helpful to overcome issues of trust, but also ensuring that the questions around impact and the importance of impact is grounded in the local context priorities. So it's really coming from the community and what they value in you know, changes in the practices. And finally, the last example, which is really about planning uh, for co-ecocities and climate resilience in Bangkok when there was lots of flooding was about co-designing and implementing data collection tools um, in a way and visualizing that and mapping methods in a way that you can articulate and share these values and outcomes with the community so that there's a discussion and there's a you know, uh, understanding of what is valuable to the community and what to then bring forward. So these are kind of very simple examples, basic examples, but, but really using evaluation as a learning process. So in terms of insights, um, if we were to adopt a more kind of learning centered approach, we're using you know, evaluation as an opportunity to learn. It's often and should be undertaken by the team and participants so that they continually reflect on what they're doing and what they're learning and what they can improve on continuously and not wait till the end. Um, it helps look for unexpected impacts um, it's really important to involve the community members and stakeholders as co-evaluators so they can have a say in what is 
important and what they need to be looking out for and what they need to be evaluating. Evaluation is going on throughout. And importantly, because of that, because you're involving the community, that then the conclusions about what is value, what has been the outcome and the impact is then, you know, seeded in, grounded in different forms of knowledge and sense-making approaches that may be very different from the, the framework that has been offered uh, from a kind of funders or an external evaluation partner point of view. So circling back to the original question I, I started with at the start of this presentation, which is why evaluate social impact you know, arising from creative activities? Um, and one of the, the key conclusions we've come from, which is to not see this as a accountability or burdensome process, but actually to use it as an opportunity to learn and to recognize that it, it can be and should be transformative to different partners, not just to the funders, um, but more importantly, to situate that to them, to um, how, what is valued and what is the impact for the community and stakeholders. Um, and this also to then, to ensure that we're continually looking for, for and recognize intangible and unintended outcomes that you often can't see uh, if they're predetermined and top down. And that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Joyce. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, I'm being proven wrong, whereas initially I opened up saying how establishing a uh, uh, discussion in a language that uh, uh, flows across different disciplines uh, is, is difficult. Uh, now it's clear that uh, there's a narrative emerging. And uh, for me so far, it's uh, that, yeah, we are in our society, we're starting from the wrong end, the, the uh, focus on uh, the how of ma measurement, the sizes, the uh, expressions of uh, um, magnitudes, rather than the purposes and the whys, the, um, the entire reason uh, for why valuation takes place in the first, uh, in the first place. But anyway, uh, thank you for that. Uh, please uh, do use Q&A function, as uh, I know some of our speakers have been uh, replying to your questions in there. Um, now, without further ado, over to you, Indy. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll build very much on what's been said, I suppose. Um, what I wanted to say was that I think it's really important that, that that creative practice isn't trapped by theories of value. Um, theories of value are actually largely out of date. In fact, you could argue we have been misvaluing everything for the last 400 years. You know, I would say climate change is such a strategic of impact that uh, it has been the fundamental mis mispricing and the misvaluing of externalities which has allowed us to do that. So the, you know, if you were to price carbon per ton on the basis of the liabilities it generates, it would be about $27,000 a ton. Uh, yet our co current carbon prices are 27, oh, 27 pounds, 30 pounds, maybe 100 pounds. So you can see a massive gap. So I want to just start by saying that, like, you know, I think there's a risk of us being dogmatically captured by theories of accounting and value that are actually out of date and fundamentally broken. And part of the role of creative practice is to challenge our theory of value in a fundamental sense. And I think that's really, really a critical point that, that I think we, I, I'd like to bring. And I'm going to share a few slides as I talk um, around what I think is happening in terms of some of these theories of value. So, one of the things is just recognizing the entanglement of the world. This is a, an obesity systems map, which shows all the different drivers and drivers and uh, interaction points of driving obesity. And you realize it's not a one-to-one -one interaction. It's a many-to-many -many interaction point, which actually constructs a liability or a social cost and a social, uh, social um effect of obesity in society. So when you start to look at this, you have to realize the fundamental entanglement that, that meant much of our value and our liabilities are actually constructed into. So how do we make change in a world which is fundamentally entangled and is also complex and emergent? I think is a really interesting question. And I think it's a really important question in many formats. 
And the other part of it is what do we value and what we do we not value? We value risk to the present, but we don't value the risk that we generate for future generations. So the risk to the present is to present asset owners, asset holders, uh, we can measure that. But what we don't measure or value is what risk we are generating for future generations in a meaningful way. So our theory of risk and our theory of evaluation is having massive holes and allowing, I would say, is a systemic um, uh, destruction of things which are actually un unconsidered. And I, you know, I would put this as a really great example of kind of a miscomprehension of value. A house, for example, um, which can have a, a resale value and a, and, a, and a rental value, also generates a huge amount of social environmental cost, whether it's CO2 released or whether it's actually health outcomes or social care outcomes, all multiplicity of outcomes, which are usually typically unpriced in the theory of a house. And you know, whether it's a tree, um, a tree, urban trees are actually only valid, understood through their costs, which are effectively their maintenance and insurance costs. All their social economic value is largely unvalued and unpriced, which means that the real in the real world, cities like Sheffield chop down their trees and then replace them with very young trees. And the reason why they do that is after 10 years, the cost of maintaining a tree becomes, ex was, becomes increasingly more uh, expensive. So our theories of value are constructing and implementing our theories of, I would say, outdated value and how we understand value and accounting is actually structuring the real world around us. And this applies, as I was saying, you know, healthcare costs associated to housing. It's millions and millions of, you know, is associated to private housing are generating, generating liabilities for us in that sense. Many of you will know the High Line uh, in New York. The High Line in New York, for example, and this is a piece of work that we did, uh, where we looked at uh, uh, the value generated by the High Line. So if you just took 10% of the land value uplift attributable to the High Line, you could have paid for the whole High Line. So 10% of the land value uplift, uplift generated by the High Line, you could have paid for the whole High Line in 10 months. So this was civic infrastructure generating huge amounts of civic uh, spillover value. Again, that value is entirely being privatized. So we are socializing costs, privatizing value in many formats. And I think there's some kind of more fundamental questions on, on this table. So when we talk about value shifting, I also think that it's really important for us to think about, you know, this is around healthcare. And I just want to see some of the architecture failures that we're seeing. The failure to treat is typically not priced in the system. The cost of treatment is. The cost of prevention isn't because it requires really 2% of our social health care budget is focused on prevention. And then thriving, the kind of net effect of, the, of all of society not having these illnesses or mental health issues, but actually being in a mental wealth model is not even valued or understood in society. So our current system really at best is seeing treatment as a cost uh, to society it doesn't see prevention as a systemic uh, accounting value. It doesn't even see thriving. So there's no doubt our health system is constructed largely on the basis of failure to treat as an accounting model, nothing more. So now the why I bring this all up is that it's really important to see, see the deficiencies in our theories of value and accounting. And I think the role of creative practice is to create new value, but also to be able to help us perceive new value and construct new value in that way. And we have to recognize that we're moving from a world where, where humans were bad robots. The value of a human was as an economic agent, as an act of production, right? And in this worldview, I would argue that it was important to make people precarious, uh, that precarity of uh, vulnerability allowed people to be instrumentalized into the market labor force and to be able to do the work that the market wanted done that actually creates a social neurological uh, space for short-termism uh, uh, th through need and narcissism, I would, I would even argue. And it creates a very particular idea of extrinsically organized individuals. Now, I think we're moving into a new phase of actual human contribution to society, which is about care, graft, creativity, complex cog cognition. 
And that requires fundamentally a different baseline of human contribution. So why I'm making this case is I think creativity has, has to be the centerpiece of the next society, which actually may have a fundamentally different theory of value, value constructing, which isn't about making people precarious, but making people, um, giving people the space to be creative to actually be able to be not instrumentalized by society, but be intrinsically motivated for the creation of things. Now that's a fundamentally different economic model and social model of society. And in that model, I think all of our functions of human contribution are moving out of the age of managerialism and production into this kind of post, what I would call post-managerialism economy or, a, or a, a, the five C's economy, this kind of age of care, craft, creativity, co complex co cognition. And that requires a new theory, I think, of creative practice and a new mechanism of seeing value in it. And it goes back to what I was saying. We know that the value of language constructs pretty much all of our worldviews. So what is, the, what is the value of reconfiguring our worldviews? What is the value of music which transforms our emotional capacity? We have not been thinking about things from a population level effects. We've not been thinking about things from a longitudinal effects. We've not been thinking about things in deep value. Our value cycles are very, very much short termist and focus on transactions. And that I think is part of the problem of us as a society being able to deal with some of the complex challenges we face. Whether it's decision making is a massive intangible asset for society, yet it's completely unvalued. So societal decision making. And I think creative practice, and I would say, you know, we're talking about the playful asset, the playful capacity of a society. So being able to be playful is an emer intangible emergent asset of society, which allows for massive value form formation. Now, in order to be able to recognize that as an asset, we have to start to invest in it and recognize that, that it's a foundational asset for a new economy and a new society and new formats. So I think there are fundamental structural shifts required in our theories of value and our theories of accounting in order to be able to unlock what I think is a new generation of value. And that does go from everyday creative practice all the way through to the deep models of creative practice, which are around world shifts and world mechanisms. And you know, there are some, there's loads of deep code errors in, in my view around instrumentalization, incentive failures, lack of shared language, all sorts of things I can talk about in some of these things, but these are fundamental in why we end up in a lot of the, lot of the short term games. So I, where I'm gonna end is I think a kind of a, a challenge that there's a deeper value change question. And I think we have to start to talk about sort of a sort of um, beyond sort of the short termism into a longer term model. We have to, we have to recognize, I think we are seeing fundamental shifts of societies built for human development and discovery in an age of automation. How do we create the value for that? Societies built with, with nature as opposed to seeing nature as a resource. Societies embracing stewardship and citizenship of everything. And societies which are actually genuinely being able to understand long term and our relationship with the future in a fundamentally different way. These fundamental shifts are really critical and these frame a new space of creative practice, which I think is really, really vital. And th this goes all, all the way through in many, many formats, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I would, uh, but I suppose I, my point here is that actually many of our, many of our theories of value are actually organized fundamentally in a different way. And we need to challenge our theory of value in a smarter format. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Indy. I, I myself feel emboldened uh, uh, your call to construct alternative uh, theories of value, I think is uh, very cogent. You have suggested a number of shifts needed yourself from the kind of managerial mode of operating to a more creative one from uh, obsessed with uh, individual to forms of collective, maybe even uh, uh, relational uh, ways, but also um, from um, this obsession about uh, capturing uh, and uh, uh, measuring uh, value to more inventive uh, value generating uh, approaches. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's all I think that have been echoed uh, throughout the presentations today. So even though we don't have very much time left, as promised, I will let the speakers today, since they have invested so much time, ask brief questions to one another, one 
a question per each speaker if you have those if if there's a specific person you are asking please name and if it's a general question uh, hopefully someone will pick it up uh paolo do you have questions yes i do i, I have a question to to lucy uh which is about the the, the role of uh you know aesthetic values in the the, the in the in the projects she shared with us um, i mean in terms of you know um, why was the you know why do you think the antarctica project uh, is is or maybe more effective than showing uh, showing a graph you know about uh, uh, raising levels of water uh, so the, the aesthetic component i'm kind of interested in, in that um, well, that links back to the imaginary, doesn't it? So how can you create imaginary? How can you create images in, in people's minds that, um, how can you prompt uh, imagination? How can you prompt um, thinking? How can you prompt um, uh, being part of participating, uh, uh, taking action? So um, yes, the, the aesthetic value um, is is a part of all of that, isn't it? Um, and I think in terms of how, how uh, we try to uh, imagine the, the aesthetic value or to create the aesthetics is um, all kinds of different layers. So building those layers, building the layer of language, building the layer of a visual, building the layer of a symbol, building the layer of um, the situation, where is it situated in Antarctica, a crazy place, you know, who would go there and why, why would we want to set up a community in Antarctica, all of that is part of the, um, the I guess, the emboldening of an, of an imagination, an imagination that can take charge uh, and move forward, this potentiality to, to catalyze uh, people, creativity and change. Right, Lucy, Lucy do, you, do you have questions to other speakers? Since uh, well, I was thinking about when I was going through my presentation, this idea of value and um, impact, because sometimes the word impact comes up and then I was, and I was translating it as value. I don't know whether that's something um, um, that we can think about. I don't know, I don't have the answer to it. Maybe somebody else can answer that. <laughs> the, the only question I think it throws up is who defines impact? and who, who constructs the legitimacy of impact. And there's a, there's a kind of violence of impact, which I think is underestimated. So who, where is the kind of legitimacy of, of, that, of that? I tend to, I'm more and more, I know there's a big push around impact economics and ROIs, impact ROIs and all that sort of stuff, but I've become much more skeptical about it because I think it, there's a real legitimacy question about that, that theory. And what are you impacting? Uh, do the other people want it impacted? Uh, who perceives it? There's a lot of really power conversations in it. But yeah, I mean, it, that's not just linguistic, but it can be just linguistic. But it can also be about power constructed in that theory as well. Mm. Alan, maybe you got something to add. That's, the, the, I love the violence of impact uh, formulation. I think it conveys a lot. Yes, I, I myself do think that uh, impact uh, and and value do come apart in quite a significant way and uh, yeah you explain why we should focus on value rather than impact but uh, jo Joyce would you like to uh, I, there, I can see there's a question specifically uh, to you so maybe I'll ask it from the uh, from the floor before letting you pose your questions to other speakers um, so is it um, uh, Evangeline Chen is asking, is it possible to use the performing objectives to achieve learning objectives, evaluate the performance, and at the same time award the learning? Um, yes, so I guess what I mean, how I'm interpreting what event Evangeline might mean about performing objectives, it might be the objective that or originally set out at the start of the project, you know, what were you, what were the aims and, and objectives of the program and, and, and how you might that use that to kind of use that as a, as a rolling, you know, learning, learning um, plan. I guess what we're, we're trying to say is that, you know, you can, uh, obviously it's important to have a sense of what your theory of change is, you know, what might you, want to affect, what might you want to impact on and in how and in what way, but to, to do that collectively, to do that 
ethically to do that morally with the community themselves and as well as obviously understanding I'm also a pragmatist so in a sense I also think we need to talk about impact because that is the language that's being used by you know um, in the sector but but to then shape those to to then be flexible enough to have those objectives shift as emergent things come along and that becomes your way of tracking has it you know your intended and unintended outcomes so I think for me yes you can do that but only if your objectives are flexible enough to be iterated over and over again and uh your opportunity to ask a question of uh, the other speaker yeah um and i guess i can pay it forward to a question to indy which is you know I, I found it was extremely interesting to see to kind of hear about the, to get the presentation and um about you know the challenge of us challenging existing frameworks and uh theories of value my question is you know um how do we even begin to do that when there is a clearly it is an issue of power and who has who has who has the right to the table to do this to, to the challenges and so how do we start making this shift so everything you said obviously we all seem you know we are on the right page but how do we start making that argument to whoever we need to be having a conversation with oh no, it's, a, it's a great question i look i mm. I don't think I don't think it's about us. I think it's to 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 a degree it's about the kind of truth in the system. <laughs> like it, it's uh, there is no fucking value. <laughs> like seventy eight percent of S and P one hundreds, if they had to price social and environmental costs, would be insolvent. They literally wouldn't exist. Most of the world around us is actually, if you in price social and environmental costs, is in net degrowth already. It has been for many years, if you're to price the social environmental costs it's generated. So I, I don't know, I, I, I feel for me, this is not a question about who has rights. I think we have an obligation to challenge our theory of value, which is killing us. And, and I, I think that's a fundamental question in, in it. So I, I don't know, I, I mean, my experience has been, you know, I was part of building two social investment structures. I, I, um, you know, help set up some of those, some of those things, part of building impact hubs. So I know the economy quite well. And, you know, we've, from our perspective, we've moved very clearly through that space and gone, this doesn't work for lots of different reasons, right? Social goods are not private value objects. So the value of the high line cannot be privatized and redlined to the cost of the private of the high line. It's a it's massive social value, just completely unpriced and privatized. So for me, I don't know, I, I think there's a sort of, and you know, like I, you know, the point I was making about uh, the discount rates question that came up, which is a fantastic question. There is a fundamental reality that we are massively destroying future generations and future op options. And that is what we're currently doing. So for me, most of our critical practice and our, our uh, so creative practice is also about a critical review of how, what is value and how we construct value in society. I think that's what it really is. It's a really deep reflective view of what is it, what is value in society. That is what creative practice is. And if we can't put the terms of how we value that value, then I think there's a really fundamental problem in our own language. I think this is about us. And I think our pathway forward in a deep sense. Um, and I think we have to recognize we have, a, we are equally as significant as doctors and other people. I think the problem is we've we've allowed ourselves psychologically to be self-perceived as sort of marginal edge, edge actors. Actually, we have a responsibility to the reframing of value in society. And you know, the legitimacy is given by the fact every value theory is fundamentally, I would argue, broken. Don't believe it. Nothing is real. Everything is a lie. You, you know, you can afford three pieces of clothing a year, three pieces of clothing a year, if you want to live in one and a half degrees three pieces right that's it so i think i i don't know i'm much more radical about this stuff at this moment that's that's great thank you indy and uh because we have four minutes uh remaining um rather than uh posing more questions if that's okay i will um ask us all 
for 30 second, seconds wrap up for what are your uh, takeaways, uh, key messages from today. Uh, for, for me, there, there were several um, uh, look at purposes, uh, first of all, not sizes, uh, it's values uh, before translating into value, if ever. Uh, there's the bankruptcy of accounting uh, regimes and uh, theories of value. Uh, which I accept, but then I also know that uh, there's this niggling question. So what do we actually do for the purposes of decision making and for the purposes of uh, uh, getting the technocratic systems going? Uh, do we want them exploded? Probably. And this relates to one of the uh, comments uh, from the participants. Uh, Kate uh, was asking about, well, so how do we go with the daily business of tracking and gathering evidence and impact anyway? So I am totally in inspired, but uh, also feel that uh, um, uh, in, in implementing the kind of vision uh, we uh, outlined today will take a bit of work. Uh, I'm passing over to Paolo for his closing reflections. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I mean, I guess a couple of main, uh, main issues here. The, the first one is really about uh, finding new ways of blending narrative and numbers. So this is something I really liked in Lucy's presentation. There were some numbers there, attendances, uh, you know, kind of uh, people participating. And those are numbers that uh, help in crafting a narrative about, about an event. So um, accounting could be helpful in that. So accounting is a body of knowledge that could be helpful if, it's, if it is not mis misused. Um, a second, a second issue is about value in change. So value in discussion, uh, and try to understand what kind of, uh, you know, reflections are triggered. So that's probably the lock is, that's probably where value emerges. Also, it remains kind of difficult to capture, but probably is a direction, uh, uh, is a direction where we could focus. And, uh, and, and we've always very careful to the techniques uh, we use. There was a comment about, you know the discount rate uh, to to assess to assess the future. Well, using the discount rate uh, is sensible if you are dealing with a shorter kind of short to medium term uh, decision. Uh, it, it may be uh, meaningless uh, if you want really to tackle the issue of uh, you know um, equity towards the future and uh, of environmental concerns. So let's use the techniques in the in the right uh, uh, in the right context. Brilliant. Okay, uh, Lucy, you're 30 seconds. No more. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was really interested to listen to Joyce's reflection on the learning centered evaluation. And then to also hear that we can drop impact and talk more about value. Um, and then I also missed a lot uh, on the aesthetic value, which I could talk about in the future. And then from Indy to be more radical, carry on doing what we're doing, but be more radical. Brilliant, brilliant. Joyce? Yeah, I think uh, likewise, I think we're coming at the idea of value from very different perspectives, yet we are, there's, you know, we're saying the same thing at just different ways of saying it through different lenses. Um, I think what I take from that is that is how we we fundamentally within our ourselves and the people and the organizations we we have agency with, with to be able to drive this change in what we perceive as value and to do so in the work that we do and what, how we can influence that. And I think I can see in all our practices, but it's, it's to um, really overcome those kind of systemic challenges that I think, you know, someone in like Lorraine mentioned in, in the chat, you know, how do you get an organization that fundamentally does not want to change, change. So that's my takeaway. Thank you. Great. And uh, Indy, your 30 seconds. Yeah, um, I would say one of the best ways to look at the problem that we're facing is the value of being human. So if you look at the value of a human, according to the insurance industry, it's about 20 or thousand pounds, maybe 25,000 pounds. But if you look at the value of being human in terms of actually 
the options into the future that that person creates, infinite options. You know, remember to evolve here, if you've any read Nova Scene by James Lovelock, it's taken 13.5 billion years, 13.8 billion years for you to evolve here. You're a king and a queen of, of, of 13.8 billion years of, jet, of evolution. Now, if you look forward into the infinite possibilities that you create on the other side, the value of being human is infinite. And I, and I think we have to asymptote that value to, to infinite to actually start to reframe our theory of value. I think, we're, I think our accounting standards and our mechanisms we're seeing are constructing a worldview, which are actually fundamentally paralyzing us and destroying the future. So I would say there's a whole bunch of creative practice required in our theory of value, because that's what we need to be able to disrupt it in a really radical format. That would be the most radical thing we can do. This is, this is a good place to stop given that we are two minutes over time. I just want to thank you because you made the event incredible and stimulating and informative and I'm sure generative. Uh, so thank you so much. There will be a recording available, I believe. Uh, um, Louise will correct me um, uh, when, if not, but I believe we will be posting it on the Social Design Institute uh, website in the next uh, few weeks. So uh, we will have a chance to relive and revisit. Thank you so much. Can I can I also just want to say thank you to Patricia uh, for bringing us together, bringing such a interesting, uh, you know, and and facilitating the conversation. So thank you to Patricia and the UAL as well for this opportunity. Pleasure. Thank you indeed. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.